So a set is just a collection of objects, uh, data, whatever you want it to be. So you have a collection of objects um, and it's typically written inside curly brackets, right? And we use capital letters to assign um, to each of the sets. So I have a couple of examples here, right? So set A could be students in the class, right? So I could take all my students who are taking quantitative reasoning and I can say, Set A is all of my students uh, in my class first name. And set B is ages, right? So I have a set of students in class. I have set B as student ages. Um, and then I can combine sets. I can have sets inside of sets. So I can say, let set C be a subset, which we'll get to in a minute, of um, students. Um, names with their ages. So you can see in set C, I have Chris, 43, right? Uh, then I have student one who may be 34, uh, student two, maybe 22, and I can basically create a list, right? And it's a list inside of a list. And again, keep this in mind because a lot of people are like, where will I ever use this? This is really used in computer language, right? So we kind of talk about it because it's logic and it's a way to organize things. And when you write computer code, if you build your stuff into sets, then I can get my computer code to quickly call those lists, right? And there is software packages out there that do this for you. Um, and once you become comfortable with them, they do it for you. And two of the most popular ones are Excel and Access, both Microsoft products, right? And so Many companies use it for this reason. Typically, Excel is the default, uh, but I have uh, used Access before where you can quickly create lists in sets, and then you can get access to generate reports by calling different lists out of those sets, right? Um, so again, probably not going to have to write the code, but you may be a person that has to use these software packages to do these things. And by understanding what the software is doing, you can quickly understand if something's gone wrong, right? Some of these are built in and like nurses have to do this. It's built into their computers they're using, but you get to call up patient's information and their records and it's pulling from two different places. Those things are called sets and they're pulling the information together for the nurse to see in the uh, patient's charts, right? And it's pulling from different places. That's what set notation, how set notation is used in the real world. We can have equal sets and all the equal sets it means is the things inside, um, are the, the same, right? And it doesn't have to be in the same order. So I have set D is one, two, F and G. Um, set E is F, G, two, one. These two sets are equal because what's inside them is the same. Don't confuse that with um, cardinal number. Cardinal number is the number of elements in a set, right? So equal sets is the stuff inside the set is identical. Cardinal number, which we're going to call equivalent sets, means they have the same number of elements inside the set, right? So cardinal number can be written in a couple of ways. Our book does kind of like an absolute value symbol around it, right? Which means the number, if you take numbers in logic, it does a little N within parentheses. So I try to share both. That way, if you're taking both classes at the same time, or if you take it again, you realize that they're the exact same thing, they're just written differently. And it is a little frustrating. I don't know why books do it, probably because it's a newer thing. You know, algebra and calculus has been around centuries. Computer mathematics has been around for, you know, a couple of decades now. So there hasn't been this, hey, this is the one and true way kind of thing. So you will see different symbols depending on authors, classes, but they mean the same thing. And so our book, again, if you see a problem that has the absolute value, it's asking how many elements are in the set. Um, you may also see it with N in parentheses, again, asking how many elements are in the set. And then things are equivalent where they use, I think it's called a tilde, the little cursive uh, squiggly thing. So A is an equivalent set of B because it has the same elements, right? Every student in my class has an age. So therefore I should have the same amount of students in the set as well as the same amount of ages. So A and B are equivalent. They not equal. Equal means that they're the same. Equivalent means they have the same number of uh, things in it. Uh, and then D and E is equal and it is also equivalent, right? <clears throat> so then we go into how we build set builder. And you, you may have seen this in algebra a little bit. 
Um, set builder is just like sets. You put it in curly brackets and then you define what the set is doing. So we could have set K um, equals X our variable and this straight up and down line, let me go to draw here, um, just means such that. I'm trying to write with a mouse, not always the easiest, such that. And kind of think of that as it's just defining it, what X is. So X such that X is a whole number, right? So if I try, that's uh, yeah, just text it, it'll be easier than me trying to draw this fun thing. Right, so in this case, what will X, K would be um, equal to, not plus, sorry, equal to, there we go, curly bracket. So what are whole numbers, right? Whole numbers are zero, one, two, three, four, five, dot, dot, dot. Goes on forever, right? Let me get this box out of my way. And so dot, dot just means it goes on forever. So there is my set X. So X takes on the values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it goes on forever. It, and then M is curly bracket, right? And so Y in this case is, I don't get a grammar mistake in here, an even number, there we go. Um, y is an element, um, an even number. So then we think ourselves, okay, what are even numbers? Well, they are two, four, six, eight, ten, comma, dot, 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 right? <clears throat> so we have two, four, six, eight, ten, and now we have our set of even numbers. So we can explain it in words or we can write it out as numbers, right? An empty set is a set that contains no elements. This is called a null set, right? So an, an example of this would be the set of states with the letter Q in it. So if you think about it, and this, I always have students that challenge me on this, um, there is no states that have the letter Q in it. There are cities, right? So that's what they usually give me. But there is, out of our 50 United US states, I guess I could just put it at the set of US states, that might be a thing, because all state means this country. So the set of US states that have the letter Q in it, there is none. So that is an empty set or a null set. There is no states that have the letter Q in it. Questions, I feel like I've been going fast, but it's a lot of definitions in 2.1. 2.2, we start to actually build things with these things. Okay, so universal set is all set elements to be considered. This is important when we get into building Venn diagrams, right? Because our Venn diagram, which is in 2.2, that is where we will have our Venn diagram designed around this universal set. And we'll, we'll break that universal set down into smaller sets, and then we'll see how they overlap and everything. And that's typically represented by the letter U. Um, in set notation, it's U. When you get into statistics, if you use Venn diagrams, they usually use the letter S um, to correspond with sample space, right? So there is a overlap between set notation and statistics uh, or probability. Um, and that the Venn diagrams can be used in both places. Typically in set notation, we use the letter U uh, to be universal set. So when you are defining your sets, try to stay away from the letter U, all right? Because it does have a, its own meaning. And then S is, um, the sample, uh, a sample space kind of thing. So those are kind of you try to stay away from, um, but all the other letters are probably good. I always say stay away from the letter O because O can look a lot like zero, but again, it's not wrong. It just can get confusing. Um, and a lot of people confuse O with the, the funny null set, which depending on how well you can see the notes, it looks like a zero, but it has a line through it. All right. Complement, my good old friend, the complement. Let me hit a couple of enters so I can move my notes up so at least I see. The complement is all elements not listed in the set, right? And so typically it is written with um, a tick mark kind of. That's what Math 135 uses. Um, our book uses what I'm used to, the bar over it. So again, two different symbols that mean the same thing. Um, and the complement, um, is just the opposite. And so when we kind of get into statistics, uh, a little bit in set notation, but really in statistics and probability, um, if I have a set and I take its complement and I add them together, I 
better get back to the universal set or in statistics and probability case, I need to get to one or 100%, right? So the complement rule is extremely, extremely important when we get into statistics and probability. But if I like say U is our universal set of all people who live in the state of Maine, its complement is all people who do not live in the state of Maine, right? Because you either live in the state of Maine or you don't, right? Now you may work and have split residences and stuff, right? But when it comes to tax purposes, you got to pick one state to be kind of resident from. So that's why I kind of listed it. it we could get into arguments where it doesn't work because of how we define things in the US, but to make simplicity here, we're gonna say you either live in the state or you don't, right? And so that all the complement means is kind of break apart and it's not inside your, your set. <clears throat> Any questions on the symbols of set notation? I know we haven't really done anything with them yet, but we'll get there. All right, so I'm going on to 2.2. So 2.2 is our good friend, the Venn diagram. Um, and I already have it built here. So I'm gonna build it again so we can see it. Um, I have the answer already here because uh, my notes are designed for us to be in the classroom. So I would have these in front of me and I'd draw this on the board. So instead of drawing the board, I'll draw it right next to it so we can talk about how building it. So U is our universal set. So it is the <clears throat> natural numbers one through 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So by defining that as a universal set, I say we have to stay within this range. Are there other numbers between one besides one through 10? Yes. But because I define this as our universal set, I don't care about all those other numbers. All right. So that's what a universal set does for you. It says, hey, this is where we stay. We only care about these numbers. And so what a Venn diagram is, let's see, I don't think the desktop has it as well, so I'll have to draw it by hand. I'm gonna make it bigger because I already know I'm gonna draw messy. A Venn diagram, which as you can see, I can't draw a straight line, is a box, right? And so typically we put our little U in the corner to say, hey, everything inside this box falls within the universal set. And then I gotta have other sets. So I have set A, A such that A is an even number. So what I do is I draw a circle A. So there is my circle A. And then I have another set called B with prime numbers. So I'm gonna have B and I know they overlap. So I'm gonna save me some time and just put them up so they overlap. So there is my two sets, set A and set B. And so B is a prime number, right? And then if we list these out, right? So what is an A? A is equal to, again, our friend, the curly bracket. What are the even numbers that are in the universal set? Well, we have two, four, six, eight, and 10, right? And then B is our prime numbers. So B is equal to curly bracket. Um, our prime numbers are two, three, five, seven. Did I get them all? I think so. Two, three, five, and seven. All right, we talked about what prime numbers and all that for last class. <clears throat> and so if I look at the cardinal rule, the absolute value of A, right? The cardinal number, how many numbers are in set A? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five numbers. So the cardinal number for A is five. The cardinal number for B is four, because there's four numbers in it. So now that I have my two sets built, I can start building my Venn diagram. So let's talk about some of these concepts. Where I have the overlap here in the middle, that is referred to as and. That is a space that I am in both places, right? So if I look at my two sets, what number is in both sets? That is a question for anyone that wants to answer. Two. two. So I put a number two here, All right? Because that's the overlap. Two is in set A and two is in set B, right? And then what I do is in the rest of the circle of A, I put all the other numbers. 
So I don't list two again because I he's already in there. As you can see, he's inside the little black, right? So then I put in four, six, eight, and ten. And then in B, we already have two. That's inside the blue circle. So I'm not going to write two again. Then I put in the numbers three, five, and seven. Now, there's an issue, right? Are all my numbers listed? And the answer is no, right? Because remember, our universal set are the numbers one to 10. Number one is not even. And number one is not prime. It's one of those weird numbers. It's called, uh, actually it's called neither. It doesn't even have a name, which is weird, but it doesn't. Um, so one is not in that set. So I list it outside the circles. And then nine is not even, and nine is not a prime number. So it is also not inside of A or B. So that goes outside as well, but it is part of the universal set. So therefore it is inside the box. And now, because I have all the numbers from you inside of my Venn diagram, my Venn diagram is complete. And what this helps me find um, is when we get into a little bit of chapter two and really into chapter three, um, well, 2.3 here is we're going to go into and, or, and all that stuff. So I'll wait a minute to that. We'll come back to this in a minute, and I think that's in 2.3. But if we go back to 2.1, if I ask for the complement of A, right? I can't remember. Does our book use the tilde or the bar? I'm trying to be consistent with our book. I remember, let me look in the book real quick. I thought it was the bar, but in my notes, I have the tilde. Oh, they use the tilde. Okay, so I was wrong. It's not the bar in our book. It is the tilde. It's the bar in 135. So the complement of A, well, that is all the numbers that are not in A, right? Which if A is even, that's a horrible curly bracket. If A is even, then the complement will be the odd numbers. So this will be the numbers one, three, five, oops, it's ugly five, seven, and nine. And then the complement of B, which is basically called composite numbers, are the numbers, um, oh, composite number and one. So it will be on the numbers one, comma, four, six, eight, nine, and 10. It's all the things that were not in B. Question on kind of how we use the things we just learned to build a visual. So the thing of a Venn diagram is like a graph. It's a visual of what we learned in 2.1. Um, I love Venn diagrams. Um, I, I think they're a great way, especially when we get into 2.3 and being able to see the ands, the ors, the nots. If you can build a Venn diagram, you can quickly start pulling out the pieces that you need. Um, and in probability, they, it's very beneficial as well. Uh, in 135, the author doesn't use Venn diagrams a lot. I wish he did. He uses mainly tables. Um, but I, I think if you can get a Venn diagram built, I can answer any. It takes a minute to build a Venn diagram. I'm not saying that. But once you have it built, I can answer any probability question within probably about 30 seconds if I have a completed Venn diagram. So a little bit to build at first, but once you have it, you kind of have all the answers to all the questions. <clears throat> all right, so subset and proper subsets. Um, so I put the page numbers because this is kind of um, tricky and uh, what they really mean. Um, so I put them down. It's not something I've I've used a lot of well as well. Um, but I have our symbols. So a subset is a symbol. It looks like a long gated C with an underline of it is the symbol for subset. And a proper subset is basically long C without the line underneath it, right? And so the kind of the difference between the two, um, again, if you page 54 and 55, right? 
So in the book, it says, if A and B are sets, B is a subset of A if every element of B is also an element of A, right? So a bunch of word jargon. But basically, the way what that means, if something to be a subset of something is it has everything in the previous set um, is listed in the other one, while a proper subset uh, contains um, one element that is missing, basically, is the way I like to look at it. So B, a subset, has this, all the sets, and a proper subset is it's missing one. So I think the easy way to kind of do this, and then this is, comes to the first question that was asked by a student we'll get to in a minute. Um, how are we doing on time? Half hour? I think we're okay to do both. So example I came up with, right? So set C um, are all students at CMCC. So set D, students who have Chris Toma as their math instructor, um, and set E is students who have Chris Toma as their math tutor, right? So D, I'll make sure I got this right because I always get them backwards. Yeah, I think it goes this one first. Is a subset of, um, no, I think it's a proper subset, is a proper, sorry. D is a proper subset of C. <clears throat> because uh, there are students here at CM that are not in my class, right? I'm not their teacher. So C, um, D is a subset. So it's everything in D is in C, but C has more things in it, right? So if I write the other way, um, C is a subset of D because all my students that are in my classes are students at CM. Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of. And then E is the empty set or the null, right, of D. And that's um, kind of like the ethics here. I can't tutor my own students because they already paid me to teach you. So I don't technically tutor you. We have office hours, right? So if you go to the Mass and Science Center at Trio, I'm not your tutor. Um, because I'm paid to tutor there, not my students. And then if I, you need help, then I work with you um, as office hours. So there is no students that are in both E and D because I don't tutor my own students. I teach my students and I tutor other people's students. So that would be the null set between those two things. Point three and 2.4. All 2.4 is is word problems. And so math, I don't know when they changed this, but they put in the words application. Um, and all application means word problems. So 2.3, we'll kind of talk about those things. And then 2.4, I have a word problem to do. Um, and then as you can see, Kim in the comments, she's had a couple questions other problems in the book and they were word problems in a Venn diagram. <clears throat> so we, I'll talk about those as well. Uh, and I'm completely fine with that. So even though I got stumped today, um, please keep asking me questions. This is how I like to go, because um, my problems can, obviously I know the answer to mine because I came up with them, but it's interesting sometimes to solve someone else's. And so I do understand the frustrations with that. Uh, and that's what I'll also try to do for the test. Um, you get a week to take the test, but during that week of the test, during the Zoom session, I encourage most of you to take it during that time. And it is not so I can check and make sure you're not doing anything wrong. It is so that you can ask questions, right? Because sometimes the questions might not make sense to you. So if you take them during the Zoom class, then I am here for, to answer your question. If you take it not during the Zoom class, then you got to email me if you're stuck. And then we got to, I got to try to explain what I'm asking, right? Because grammar is not my strength sometimes. So I may not ask it clearly. So I do encourage you to take your test during the Zoom session if you can, because that way you have access to me instantly while you're taking your test and say, hey, I have no idea what you're asking right here, and then I can assist you. 
So sticking to our Venn diagram that we just created a minute ago, we're going to go into some operations with sets. And so the key things that we're going to use are the words and, or, and not, or a combination of them, right? And so the way I like to think of and, and means it has to be in both. It has to be within both sets, right? And so we can see here by looking at our Venn diagram, this is why Venn diagrams are so good. I can see the only number that is in both is the number two, right? So the set A and set B, the symbol for it is this upside down U. Um, that what is the symbol for and. And so the answer for our problem, again, trying to draw a curly bracket, is the number two. Right. Or means I can be in both or I can be in just A or I can just be in B. Right. So the way I like to think of it or is if you're in any of the allowed places, then you count. What you do not do is list the numbers twice because you can see two is in both A and B. So I'm not gonna write it twice. So if I write out or, and I'll change my color just so we can kind of be to this together. Or would be the numbers two, three, five, no, I already went out of order, but that's fine. Four, six, seven, eight, and 10. Right, it is all the numbers that are inside of the circles, right? And if you don't have a Venn diagram, another way to do this is if I list out set A again, so I'll write over here on the side. So A equals the numbers two, four, six, eight, and 10. B is equal to the numbers, oops, not parentheses, sorry, curly bracket two, three, five, and seven. So when I go to do and, right, and, and we'll highlight and, no, well, there we go, highlight. When I go to do and, it is the numbers that are in both. So if I list out both sets, you can see that the number two is in A and the number two is in B. So there is how I could do it without a Venn diagram. If I list out my sets, I can just look and say, okay, what, num what number is in both of them? That is and. Or is all the numbers that are listed in the sets you just do not write the same number twice. So it is the numbers two, four, six, eight, ten, three, five, seven. So or means I can be in either place and means I have to be in both, right? So that is kind of the key takeaway I look at when I am looking at and and or. Not goes to our lovely friend of our asterisk, right? Which is a little hard to see here. So this is where listing out the things will help. So I don't want, I'm not gonna, well, yeah, I'll erase it. People can go back and watch this. So I'm gonna get rid of my A and or B here again. Get rid of my highlighter. So I have my sets listed out. So if I want set A, which again is, I'll go to highlighter. Set A is all of these numbers or not B. I guess I do have to do this again. So this is where it gets a little tricky. So let me go like this. I'll go, we'll go right below. So what is not in B? So not in B. So not in B is the numbers, all the numbers besides two, three, five, seven, right? So one, uh, two's not, two's in B, three's in B, four is not, five's in B, six is not, seven's in B, Eight's not, nine's not, ten's not, right? Don't overthink this. It's not, it just means this, that, right? So what's not in B? One, four, six, eight, and 10. So again, we're doing or. So or means all the numbers. So if I write this out, uh, we'll do black in this case. Just try to keep my 
Oops, that's different. We remember you list everything. So what is an A? Two, four, six, eight, and ten. All right, and now list what's not in B. One. I've already put a four in there, so I'm not going to write it again. I've already put a six in there, so I'm not going to write it. Eight's already in there. I am missing nine, uh, and ten's already in there. So that my black set there is what is in set A or not B. It's the numbers two, four, six, eight, ten, one, and nine. All right. So sometimes listing them out where you can see everything can help. Uh, assist with that. If I look up here in my Venn diagram, and I will use blue highlighter, I want set A. So that is everything that's in where I'm highlighting blue, right? That's set A. And not B is everything outside of B. So there's the numbers again, one, nine, two, four, six, eight, and 10. And what gets confusing here is students like to argue when they're first learning this, and I understand, but they're like, well, twos and B. So how can it count? Because the reason it can count is, is because it's in A also, right? And that's where it gets tricky because a lot of students are like, well, two shouldn't count. Well, two does because it's an or. An or just means I have to be in one or the other, right? Yes, two is in B, but it is also in A. So therefore it does count. All right, so I'll even highlight this blue. So if you come back and look at my notes later, that's why I colored that guy all blue. <clears throat> so what is in set A and not in B? So now what we have to look at is we look at set A, and I'll unhighlight set A for a minute. We'll just circle the numbers that are the same and not. So remember, this has to be in both. So if we look at A, I have the numbers two, four, six, eight, and 10. I look at B, I have the numbers one, four, six, eight, nine, and 10. What numbers are in both? No, actually I'll do highlighted because that's a, it'll be a little easier than drawing circles. Um, we'll do a light green highlighter. So I have a two and A and I have, oh no, I don't have a two and B. So erase that, that was wrong. There, try it again. I have a four and A and I have a four not in B. I have a six and an eight and a 10. I have a six, eight and skip over nine and a 10. So those are the numbers that are in both. So if I write this down here, we'll go back to draw. Um, I know most people don't like red so I can find another color. I, don't, I think purple's okay to see, we'll do purple. God, my curly brackets are getting worse as I go. So my numbers are four, six, eight, and 10. Questions? <clears throat> All right, last thing before I go into a couple problems, is just basically everything we just learned, but just using a word problem. So I am gonna build a Venn diagram, um, and it's a word problem, so that's why it's considered 2.4. Um, of all these values I have here of students at CM. So let's see if I can build this thing here. So draw a big old Venn diagram. Because I'm gonna need lots of room. Because I, I I have more than two sets in this one. I have three. So first we have U is the set of CMCC students um, uh, with total of three thousand students at CM. And I don't know what our actual number is today. I just made these numbers up. Um, so here's our universal set. It's all students at CM. So let A be the students who are getting a general studies degree, right? So we have set A students who are getting a general studies degree. We have set B, students who are in TRIO, right? We talked about TRIO a little bit last class. So there's my, I should make that a little bit bigger. Uh, yes, I knew a race was gonna get me. Undo, undo, undo. All right, draw, let's make B a little bit bigger. B is my TRIO students, there we go. 
And then set C as the students enrolled in online. So this is pre-COVID because now we know everybody's online, but we'll go pre-COVID. Uh, students taking online classes. So try to draw a big circle. And you can see my artistic skills are wonderful. <clears throat> my daughters are actually really good at art um, and drawing. I am not, so they did not get that from their father. And it's not, I ain't gonna blame the mouse because if we're in class, I couldn't draw one either. So there would still be squiggly circles. So we have our three lovely circle Venn diagrams here, A, B, and C. So now we have to start understanding what the verbiage means. And so the way I like to look at it is I find the easiest number to work with. And the easiest one to work with is starting with this, when I have three of them, is starting with this little triangle right here that I'm highlighting in green. And the reason is because that is a very special one. That little triangle is in A and in B and in C. So I always look for the and, right? So when I have a two, that's easy. It's just where the two circles overlap. When I have a three, I find that little triangle in the middle that has all three. And now I work backwards. So I come over here, um, students in general studies, online and in trio is 35, right? So I know the number that goes in here and I'm gonna have a hard, let me try to put a text in there. Maybe that'll make it a little bit easier. 35, I'm gonna have to move it so you can see it. There we go. So we know 35 goes inside the little and, right? Now I can start working my way backwards. So this bigger circle here is, you know, this little piece right here that I'm going to kind of put a little red line over. That is this part that is A and B, right? So that A was general studies, B is in trio. So I'm looking for a sentence that says students in trio and general studies. And there it is, I'll underline it in red. That number is 70, right? Oh, I meant to change these numbers from last semester and I forgot, dang damn it. You'll see why in a minute. So if there is a total of 70 in that red circle, right? Well, oval, I guess is the proper shape of it. And there's 35 is already in part of it. That means I have to take 70 and subtract the little triangle of 35, which also gives me, ah, my, my hit. Ah, I lost my text box here, escape, which also gives me, in this case, 35. That's why I want to change the numbers because they both end up being 35 because if I need to change my numbers and I forgot. So, Everybody understand why that number is also 35. So then I put a 35 here. And this one I'll just write instead of trying to draw text boxes everywhere. Because the two numbers inside the red have to add up to what the problem says they were. And they said they're 70, right? So now I can finish A. No, I can't finish A yet because I am... Uh, missing pieces. So let's finish another and. So let's do A and C. So A is general studies. C was online. So we'll underline, oh, we already have an underline in green. So we'll underline him in back. So just general studies and online is 775, right? So I'll put it over here. I take the 775 and I'm going to subtract the 35, the little triangle again, right? And I'm going to try to do math in my head. So that should be 740. Hopefully someone's checking my arithmetic with me. So that means this number over here is 740. Because 740, that's ugly four. Plus 35 is 775, which means everything that is in this and circle, uh, we'll do him in black, right? This piece right here that I'm circling in black, that is the and, that is the part of the circle where A and C overlap. So that gives me my 740. 
And then finally, we can get this last little piece, the piece of B and C. Let's do our lovely friend, the purple again. So we're going to get this little piece right here. I'm doing it in purple. So that's the 115. So I'll bring up my little text box. I will do 115 minus the 35. Again, that little triangle. And this will give me... Eighty, five, and eight and three is eleven. Yep, eighty. So that number is eighty. So we'll put him in black. So that means this number is eighty. All right, I'm gonna pause there for a minute. One, hopefully someone's checking my arithmetic for me because I am doing it in my head. Um, and two, to see if we have any questions of where I've gotten these numbers from. I see where you get them from, but I just, I guess I just don't understand why, why we would have to deduct the 35 from the 775. I mean, I get it, but I don't. Okay. Nope. Perfect. That's a great question. I am hundred percent understand what you're asking. I really do. So what we have to be careful with is when they give us these numbers, right? If we don't take out the 35, what ends up happening is we end up double counting, right? And so, hope I don't mind. Hope you don't mind me using you. So you're in trio, and you're also trying to get in the nursing program, right? So we count you in trio. The nursing program will count you as well, right? But CM, you are just Julie Brown. So to them, you are the one student, right? But we have you're in two different sets for the school, and so. What we have to be careful that why we pull you out is that we don't actually double count you. If we don't take that out and we just put the 775 where that 740 is, now I have double counted you and you're counting twice. And so then I will have too many values inside my Venn diagram because you fall in two categories. Does that, make, has that help clear it a little bit? That does. Yeah. And that's what it's good. Because in the end, what we're going to check, right, is if... But not if. Once I have my Venn diagram complete, if I add up all the numbers in the Venn diagram, I better get back to 3,000. If I do not get 3,000, typically what happens is you get over 3,000. That means you double counted. Somewhere you forgot to take someone out. And that's why when I build these, when someone gives me the numbers, I start from the inside and I work my way out. And that is what helps me prevent double counting. Um, and so... That's really what it comes down to is just not double counting these things. <clears throat> so the last piece is finishing the low place where I don't have these numbers, right? So I, oh God, I got off my draw here. Home, escape, let's get this box out of the way. Perfect. So we come back up here, we got A. A has 900 students, right? So the problem is right now in A, you can see we have 740, we have 35 and we have 35, right? But all these numbers in A need to add up to 900. So what I need to do here for A is I need to take the total that's supposed to be in A, which is 900 students. I subtract out my trio students and I subtract out my online students. So I subtract out 35, I subtract out the 35, and I subtract out the 740. Because if I don't take those numbers out of my 900, then I am going to end up double counting. So now I'm going to get a calculator because I'm not going to try to do this in my head. Clear. 900 minus 35 minus 35 minus 740. And I get 90. So my final number that goes into A is 90. And what are those 90 students? Those 90 students are students who are not in TRIO, who are not getting a general studies degree and are not taking classes online, right? Oh no, they are getting a general studies degree, sorry. They, that 90 is students who are getting a general studies degree, but are not in TRIO and not taking online classes.
okay? So, and if I add up all those numbers, I will get back to my 900. So B, 174. So now let me bring up another text box. That's because of my horrible handwriting. So we're gonna do B, I can put him over here. So we'll take the total number of students in TRIO, 174. We'll subtract out all the numbers that you can see in B. So again, we have our lovely friend, the 35. We have the second 35 and we have the 80. So 174 minus 35 minus 35 minus 80. And we get 24. So B is blue, so we'll stay in the blue. So I have 24 students in TRIO who are not getting a general studies degree and are not taking classes online. And then finally, or no, not finally, we actually have one more box after this. Um, put in my bring text box. We have C. C has 1,100 students. And we're going to subtract out the numbers that are already in C. So 740 minus the 35 minus the 80. So 1,100 minus 740 minus 35 minus 80. 245. So there's 200, oops, uh, that's green. So 245 students that are, make sure I get this right, are taking online classes but don't have a general studies degree and they're not in TRIO. Are we done? No, I see head shakes. We're missing what? We're missing the number that goes outside. We're missing the, the students who are not general studies, not in TRIO, or not taking online classes, right? And so how do we find that? Well, we get to take all these lovely numbers here inside the circle and subtract them from 3,000, right? And I don't remember the answer off the top of my head, so I'm gonna cheat because I do have the answer already for us to see. So I'm gonna click on the answer real quick and that answer is 1751. So just to speed up the process because I think we all can figure that out. There's 1,751 students who do not fall in sets A, B, or C. And now if I add up all the numbers in the box, I better get 3,000. So very tedious, I'm not gonna say it's not. Um, but once you have it, now I can quickly start to look at things and see, um, you know, if I can say how many students are, you know, not taking online classes and not in TRIO, and then I can just start pulling those numbers out and I can answer a lot of questions quickly, um, which is kind of the example that we're going to do here in a minute that someone asked me to do. If we have time, we have 25 more minutes. I think we'll have time though. So barring any questions, a couple of last things to talk about. Things are called disjoint when there is no and. So you have two sets and they do not overlap. They have nothing in common. And when that happens, that is called disjoint, no overlap. Um, there is a thing called the additive law where they call it, and I think in, inclusion minus inclusion principle. I like to think of it as the additive law because in probability we use it a lot and it is called the additive law in probability. But if I take my or, my or will equal all of the cardinal in A plus all of the cardinal in B minus the and. And basically that is exactly what we were doing up here. We were taking the and, we are subtracting it out of the whole to find the missing pieces, right? Um, so what this is saying, right, I can find A or B. So if I take A, which in this case, A is 900. Oops, 900. I add the B. And so how many people we said was in true? 174. And then we subtract out the and. So general studies and TRIO was one, no, general studies and TRIO, where are you at? Oh, right there, TRIO and general studies is 70. And I subtract out the 70, I will get how many are in A or B. So calculator 900, 
plus 174 minus 70 equals 1004. So there's using like, I don't want to call it algebra, but there's using a formula. Another way though, is I can just go here and go to my Venn diagram, right? And if I add um, 90, 35, 24, 80, and 740, if I add all the numbers that are in the circles of A and, or B, I also will get 1004, right? So the formula, what it does is it takes out the double count, kind of what I was talking to earlier when Julie asked her question, right? The formula says, hey, take out the people you count twice, take out the overlap. I don't have to use that formula if I use the Venn diagram and just pull the numbers out of my Venn diagram that meet the criteria I'm looking for. So there's always more than one way in this course to solve a problem. Um, that's why some like and some don't, but just don't mix them up, right? So we, and, and what I'm saying is don't add up 90, 7, 40, 24, and then subtract out the other things. That's not gonna give you the right answer. So don't mix these two up. One is the formula where I just take the numbers out of the problem versus one is create a Venn diagram then pull the numbers out that I need, all right? <clears throat> D Morgan's law, I like to think of it as the distributive property, right? If you think back in algebra, when you had a number outside the parentheses and you distribute it to the number inside the parentheses, but what it does is it changes it, right? So if I have A or B in parentheses and I have the not on the outside, when I distribute the not to the inside, the sets don't change, but the operation does. And it goes from an or to an and. So the easiest way to show this is with a Venn diagram, right? So I have A and I have a B, right? So A or B, remember we already proven that, that is everything, I'll use a highlighter. That is everything that's inside the circles here, right? A or B is all of this inside the circles. And because like order of operations, we do what's in the parentheses first. So A or B not, so what is not inside the circle, and now I'll draw it, we'll draw it with green. Well, then that's everything outside the circle, right? Instead of highlighting and stuff. So everything I just did gr as green, that is not A or B. All right, now if I draw another Venn diagram, A and B, so there's A and there's B. Okay, so what is not A? Well, not A is everything outside of A, right? which includes this little piece of B, right? What is not B? Well, not B is everything outside of B and also what's not outside, what's inside of A, not the overlap, right? Now, remember the term and means it has to be in both. So on my Venn diagram, where is it colored both blue and green? Everything outside the circles. So I, I don't really know the purpose of D. Morgan's law besides the fact that it just shows that the operations change um, because if you solve it one way or the other, you get the exact same answer. So the way I like to just think of D. Morgan's law, so I don't spend a lot of time on it, is, is basically a way to get rid of the parentheses. If I distribute the not through, the parentheses go away, just like the distributive property says in algebra. However, what I need to do is also change my operation. I go from and or to and, or I go from and to or. And it's easy to show that with a Venn diagram. And page 65 and 66 kind of do the pretty colored Venn diagrams as well. So that's all of chapter two. We still got about 19 minutes, so I can still answer the two questions that I, were at, I was asked earlier um, before class. Uh, but any questions over any of the material concepts before we do these two poems out of the book? And I'm, I'm more confident in my abilities to do these next two for sure. Because I think I know what the book's asking in these. No questions? Okay. 
So problem 41 on page 70. So let me go to the book here and see what that is. I think it's just a Venn diagram, so I don't have it already in here. Um, problem what? 41 on page 70. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna draw what the book has. So the book has a Venn diagram that looks like this. So, oh, you set notation to represent the shaded region. Okay, so it has an A and it has a B. So set A and set B and the part that is colored, so bring up my little highlighter, is There we go. I think you get the idea. <clears throat> that piece, right? So it says that part is colored. So it wants the set notation of that. So obviously we have something to do with A. So I'm going to put in, oh, why did I draw my A looking like that? That's a weird A. We know it has something to do with A, right? So if we think about this for a minute, all right, so what do we have? We have A, right? But what are we missing? We're missing the and piece, correct? So I want A, but I don't want to include B, right? And the reason I don't want to include B is because it has that overlap. So if I do a B complement, that means don't include B. Now, this is where the tricky part is. Is it and or is it an or? Well, if I do or, remember or means I can be in one place or the not. So if I do or, then I'm gonna end up coloring this middle piece because A or not B includes the middle piece. So if I don't want to include that, then it has to be an and. So I want A and everything that is not B, right? And everything that is not B is everything outside the circle of B. But because I don't want to include this piece, right? I don't want to include that. And I don't want to include that. If I use or, those pieces are included, right? And so by using and, and also means it has to be in both. And so the only part that is in both is not, is by including just this A piece. So could you also say the cardinal of A? Yes, so to answer your question that you asked me, you could if they gave us values, right? So you would get the same answer. Um, and I guess you don't even have to use the cardinal. You could say A subtract A and B. Yep, yes, to answer your question, that is correct as well. Um, I wouldn't use cardinal because they don't give us any values here, but what you could, so what Kim asked in her email is she's saying, could this work? A, all of A minus A um, and B, right? And so the subtraction means take, cut off that little and piece. And yes, that could also work. Questions? All right, so seven, problem 17 on page 78 is basically very similar to our CM problem, right? We're gonna create a, a triple Venn diagram of, um, give me some space to work here. Ah, that's not what I wanted. Escape, get out of draw mode. All right, so create our Venn diagram. So we have, again, our universal set. So I always like to put a U in here. Um, and I know it says ABC here, but I wanna give these things set. So a survey of 125 freshmen of business students at a large university have the following results. They read the Money Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, or Fortune. So let's say, this one is money, so I'll call it M. 
and then we'll make our other diagram um, Wall Street W, Wall Street, so we'll call that W, and then we'll make our third circle uh, to be, they read the Fortune magazine, so we'll call that F. So F for Fortune, <coughs> M for Money Magazine, and W for the Wall Street Journal. So again, what we want to do is find the one that has, start with our little triangle. So we come in here and we can see nine, read all three. So I know this little number in here is nine. Now, <clears throat> start working our way out. So who, we need to now do money and Wall Street. So do they give us that information? Money and fortune, Wall Street and fortune. All right, so they don't give us that one. So we'll come back to that in a minute. 13, read money and fortune. So that's between M and F. So if there's nine already in there, then that means this other number has to be four, right? Because money and fortune is um, 13, and four plus nine is 13, so that's a four. So that guy's done. I'll put a little check mark by him so I know I didn't do it. Then 11, read Wall Street and fortune. So that is between W and F. We already have nine in there and we need it to be 11. So we will add the number two right here because nine plus two is 11. So I have that guy. <clears throat> and now you can see I have most of fortune done. So I'm gonna skip up here to fortune and that's 32. So 32 minus two is 30 and then four and nine is 13. So that should be 17. So, 17 plus two is 19, 19 plus two is 18, I mean 28, not 18, and then four is 32. Okay, so that adds up to 32, so he's done. 25, read the Wall Street, I'm missing too many numbers so I can't do that yet. 35, read money, so I'm missing too no many numbers so I can't do that one yet. So that means we have to finally come back to this 21, right? So 21, read money, but not the Wall Street. Okay, so there's the piece. So this is the tricky one. So I'm gonna try to highlight and hopefully it doesn't mess up my stuff too hard to see. So read money, but not Wall Street. So if I color this in this green, I'm reading money, but not Wall Street. So it's almost to the back to that same problem that we just did a minute ago, right? It is this piece. Uh, this colored green, right? So if that's supposed to be 21 and I already have four in there, and I'm gonna go back to my drawing and put a black so it's a little easier to see in the colored green. 21 minus four is 17. So then therefore this has to be 17. And now I can finish money. If 35 read money, I take 35 and I subtract 17 and 13. So that's 30. So that means this has to be five. And then Wall Street is 25. So we take out, so that's nine. Might that make sense to everybody? What number is this problem? 17? Okay, so they don't even have a Venn diagram built. <clears throat> so what I need to do now, which they don't have the answer, so I'm gonna cheat because uh, we got nine minutes left, okay. I like using Excel as a calculator. So I'm gonna bring Excel, Excel to be a calculator and I'll share my screen so you guys can see how I use Excel to be calculators. So share, a new share. Here's Excel, share. So I have Excel. So basically all I am doing is I'm gonna shrink this down so I can see my picture behind it. No, you can't, unfortunately, I wish I could share two things. So it says there's 125 total students, right? And so all I'm gonna do is gonna put an equal sign into Excel to turn it to a giant calculator. And then I'm gonna take the 125 and I'm gonna subtract all the numbers that we put in the Venn diagram. So minus 17, minus the five, minus nine, minus four, minus two, minus nine, minus 17. 
So make sure I didn't miss any numbers. 17, 5, 9, 4, 9, 2, 17, 62. So therefore, I know, shrink that down, go back to my new share, go back to my diagram. Now I know the number outside here is 62 because all these numbers add up to 125. And you could easily done it in a calculator. I didn't have a nice calculator available and I didn't want to use my cell phone for those. So now my Venn diagram is complete. So now let's answer the questions. How many students read none of the publications? So that answer is the number on the outside, which is 62. So these all should be lowercase letters because that's just in the book. So I'll just say little a equals 62. I'll fix my notes afterwards. Because that's all the number that's outside the circle, right? Um, B, how many read only fortune? So that is the number that doesn't overlap the other circles. So B would be 17. So you can see why it takes a minute to create the Venn diagram, but no matter how many questions they ask, I can just pull the numbers out. And then C, how many students read money and the Wall Street Journal, but not fortune? That is our free little guy that's in M and W, but is not listed here in F. So that is five. So 62, 17, and five. Now, Kim, I don't remember the answers. Oh, yeah, your answer is correct then. Did the book tell you it was wrong that you looked up? Because I just realized that we get the same answers. Yeah, the book has a different answer, I believe. Oh, then the book is definitely wrong, which is because I, I wonder, did you do the easier in the ebook or the printed? Because I got the printed book in front of me and it says 62, 17, and 5 in mine. Maybe there's a typo in yours, maybe. So if you, if we're looking at a book and you have the different answers, 17 on page 78 should be 62, 17, and 5. And I'm looking at my book and it does have 62, 17, and 5. So check your books. That does happen sometimes with the authors. I think we all make mistakes. Um, but that is, yes, I didn't even realize because I didn't look at your answer that you sent me. I just wanted to do the problem with for the class. Do you have the right answer in your email? So let me see if your books are the same as the one I got. So are your answers written in the margins? No, you have to look in back. Oh, that's weird. Is this a, oh, I am looking at the instructor's version. I didn't realize that the instructor's text in front of me. I thought I grabbed the student one. Yeah, so the, for everyone that does this problem, if you look in the back of the book, the back of the book is wrong then. Um, the answer is 62, 17, and 5. Um, and then I got the instructor's version in front of me, and it does say the same numbers I got, too. So sorry about the typo that confused you, but you did it correctly. All right. Wow. Almost took the full hour and a half again. Uh, good news, like I said, we're going to kind of slow things down, especially 3. 3 is probably the, the toughest of all the chapters. Um, and that is, again, it's not anything that's not doable. It is something you've probably not seen. It's, they're called truth tables. And I think they're kind of fun. They take a little bit to get used to. So we're gonna take two weeks to get through chapter three because truth tables are a little tricky to gain or understand. But once you got them, they're kind of fun, I think, in my opinion. But the good news is if you understand the and, or, and the not, that continues on into chapter three. Um, and I was telling someone earlier in the class, this class can be a little frustrating and I got a lot of people that just wanna quit after a little bit. Please don't do that. This class, just the way it's designed, actually starts out harder and finishes easier. Um, so we're actually doing the hard stuff first. Um, so if you're getting this, great. If you're not, stick with me. I will keep helping you. Um, and I promise we'll all get there in the end if you stay with me. Any questions? I'm going to stop the recording.